joining us for this MDA Engage community webinar on durable medical equipment. Many in the neuromuscular community will have a need for some type of durable medical equipment and assistive devices. And today will be the first webinar of our two-part series on this important topic. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. We are thrilled to have you join us today and educational webinar. The webinar today is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series that focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual education events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing to ensure that those who are not able to join us live today are able to access this information. Please note that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A window to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A bubble to open the window and enter your question. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. As questions come up along the webinar, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our speaker whom you will meet shortly. I would also like to thank our event supporter, Hilrom. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support. So thank you very much. Let's review the objectives for today's webinar. Attendees will review what durable medical equipment, DME, is, learn about terms that are associated with DME, review the process of obtaining DME, and discover what questions a person with a neuromuscular disease should ask their provider before obtaining DME. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Vicki Kern received her master's in physical therapy from the University of Delaware and has worked with children in all settings in which they might receive PT, inpatient and outpatient rehab, NICU, PICU, acute care, early intervention, preschool, school, both in school and homebound, even providing hippotherapy on her own farm on her retired dressage horse. Today, she focuses on children and adults with neuromuscular diseases and cerebral palsy, providing ongoing care in outpatient clinics, as well as completing early intervention evaluations and setting up plans of care in the home and community. Last year, she was the lead author on an article on the use of orthotics in boys with Duchenne for ankle management published in Muscle and Nerve. Vicki is the lead clinical evaluator at Penn State Health Hershey for the Pediatric Neuromuscular Program. She lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and two teenage boys and her yellow lab bear, while her daughter and son live up the road with her two grandchildren. Vicki enjoys teaching martial arts, training bear in agility, and teaching at her church. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Vicki. And if you give me a second, Vicki, I will start sharing your presentation. Super. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for that lovely introduction, too. Let me know when you have our first screen up. There we go. You are ready to go. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. As Michelle mentioned, we're going to be talking about some of the terms and processes that surround durable medical equipment. Next slide. All right. So first of all, when we talk about an explanation of terms, it's important to understand the function and role of Medicare in largely defining coverage criteria for everyone. Primarily, Medicare will pay 80% of a covered item cost, and you may have other coverages like Medicaid that may cover the rest, or you may qualify for other non-insurance funding options like the VA for our veterans. Third-party private insurances and Medicare supplements can have their own definitions, 
inclusions and exclusions, but largely they use those definitions from Medicare. So Medicare is that federal program that provides health care for the population over 65. Under 65 with a disability and does not uh, include information about your income. Medicaid, which is also known by the name medical assistance in Pennsylvania, is a state and federal program that provides health coverage if you happen to have a very low income. You may have both of these programs if you qualify for each of them under their separate eligibility criteria. And because this can get a little bit complicated and the applications can be somewhat daunting, it's really helpful to have a social worker on your team. They have a great understanding of the different kinds of coverages that are available, especially in their different parts of the country and in the world. Coverages can be different under each part of Medicare, Medicaid, third party private insurance, and all over the country and the world. Next slide. So what exactly is Medicare? It has four parts, and here you can see a description of the different categories. Part A is that which is being billed for any inpatient services that you might need. Part B is going to be considered your medical insurance. This is for your care as an outpatient, and it's the primary section that we're gonna be talking about as it covers durable medical equipment. Part C is listed here as a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, that is a type of health insurance available in the United States that provides Medicare benefits through a private sector health insurer. This is not the same thing as a Medigap or a Medicare supplement. This is using a third party private company to manage your Medicare federal funds. Part D are your prescription drug coverages. As I said, primarily we're gonna be dealing with Med B for equipment. Next slide. Medigap um, is a Medicare supplement insurance. Original Medicare does pay for much, but not all of the cost of covered healthcare services and supplies. A Medigap or Medicare supplement insurance policy can help pay some of the remaining healthcare costs, such as co-pays, co-insurances, or deductibles. Um, Medigap is a separate policy that you purchase and pay for versus the idea we said about Medicare Advantage, where you're simply enrolling for your Medicare benefits through a third party. Next slide. So durable medical equipment. We want to talk about what it is now that we have an understanding of Medicare and some very broad strokes. So we're going to talk about each of the definitions of Medicare, uh, I mean, of durable medical equipment as defined by Medicare. So durable, pretty simply, means that it can withstand repeated use. It has to be used for a medical reason. It has to be useful to someone who is sick or injured, and the opposite is true, not useful to someone who is not sick or injured. It has to be used in your home, and it has to have an expected lifetime of at least three years. We're gonna take each one of these bullets separately. Next slide. So we need to understand uh, some complications in the concept of durable. It is uh, on the one hand fairly clearly defined and on the other hand, it's a little loose. We wanna understand the difference between the items lifetime for replacement which Medicare defines as five years, and the requirement that its lifetime be at least three years in order to fall under the category of durable. So if the item is designed to last for at least three years, it is considered durable, but the expectation is that it will actually last five years before needing a complete replacement. Um, if the item is so worn out from day-to-day -day usage that it can no longer be repaired or is not cost-effective to repair, that would be considered a reason for replacement. This is the part that's not very clearly defined. This is assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Certain items like tires, belts, even upholstery can and probably should be replaced more than once in the lifetime of the item. 
It is possible that some vendors will advocate for a replacement if the needed repairs to make something safe and functional and fit properly are equal to or greater than 75% of the cost of a replacement and you're at or beyond three years of age of the device. There are some differences with adult and pediatric uh, equipment. Pediatric wheelchairs are designed to be grown or have the frame expanded and should be grown or expanded at least one time before requesting a replacement. Uh, there are ways to, uh, if there's a substantial change in the patient's presentation or their needs that necessitates changing to a completely different design, that would fall under that case-by-case exception. Medicare covers repairs up to the cost of replacement. Um, and this is where we want to think about uh, other big ticket items that you might purchase. I often think about wheelchairs like cars. When you go to buy a car, you may go and get estimates or look at the same type of car at several different places. Um, but you're not going to do that with your power chair or with your manual wheelchair. You're not going to get multiple um, estimates because they're all going to come in right around the same amount. So there isn't any value in trying to locate a particular vendor who might have something on sale. That isn't the way this stuff works. Um, we'll talk in a little bit about how the vendors are able to be reimbursed and what the process is like. But their billing system controls the way they can bill for selling you the equipment and for repairs. So when you have a piece of equipment that needs repair, you have to work with the vendor who sold you the equipment. Uh, you can, if you're unhappy with that vendor for some reason, you do need to stick it out with them to have things repaired until you meet the criteria for replacement, at which time you could switch to vendors for the next purchase. This is because the way the billing is controlled for a vendor, uh, they don't get um, much reimbursement at all for their actual labor. Uh, and they really can only bill for the pieces of equipment they're using in the repairs. So the place where they can make any kind of profit margin is on the original sale. And that is actually strictly controlled as well. There is really no ability for a vendor to like price gouge or anything of that sort. It's all very controlled by the Medicare system. Next slide. So let's talk about the next category, used for medical need. So the definition of medical need is that certain diagnoses indicate certain pieces of equipment. Um, most people who are going to be logged on here are going to have someone themselves or a family member with a neuromuscular disease. And that's going to have a diagnosis code. It might be Duchenne's, it might be ALS. That specific medical diagnosis does not specifically indicate a, a piece of equipment because not every patient with ALS is going to need any specific piece of equipment. They all may end up needing something similar, but at different times in the progression of that disorder, different pieces of equipment are indicated. And so we're going to use diagnosis codes that directly indicate the piece of equipment that we feel you are going to need. So here's my example. Let's talk about a patient who's able to walk, but who has weak muscles in the front of their ankle. This causes a foot drop when their foot is lifted off of the floor so that their toe hangs down instead of being pulled up. Now, as they're stepping forward, they have to lift their leg higher in order to clear that drop toe. And when they place their foot on the floor, the toe hits first instead of the heel. So we have several diagnosis categories involved in this issue. We have the underlying medical disease, whatever that may be. We have foot drop because that's literally what's happening as they walk. We have weak ankle muscles, which is causing the foot drop and is likely secondary to their neuromuscular disease. We have altered gait because they're walking differently than someone who didn't have the weakness. All of those indicate the need for an ankle foot orthosis. So you can see why you need a skilled physical therapist a knowledgeable doctor and a knowledgeable assistive technology professional to uh, decide how we're going to justify and specify the piece of equipment. 
I prefer to use at least three diagnosis codes in addition to the medical diagnosis as part of my justification. So if you don't have the proper starting points, your, your um, person who's reading your order form and your letter of medical necessity is not necessarily someone with a uh, medical background. They may not understand why you need the piece of equipment that's being ordered and you can get an early denial. So it's important to make sure that the medical need, the reason and the diagnoses all line up with the codes for the equipment. These connections are defined by Medicare. And we're going to talk more about that in our next webinar. Next slide, please. So the next component of durable medical equipment is that, whoops, I'm sorry, my slides are advancing a little too fast. Um, it is not useful to someone who does not have the diagnosis or the condition. So you can see that this is kind of a, a different way of saying there's a medical need. This is just using negative terminology in the statement instead of the positive terminology of medical need. So this is re-emphasizing that medical indication. And we've already said that big ticket medical diagnosis of ALS or Duchenne's or myasthenia gravis is necessary, but it's often insufficient to track directly to your durable medical equipment. So the sequela or the downstream problem of the diagnosis is what generally indicates the equipment. Because we're looking at something that's not useful to someone who doesn't have these diagnoses or conditions, things that are used by the average person are excluded. Things like fitness equipment or adjustable beds that have become extremely easy to obtain are not considered durable medical equipment because they're useful to someone who doesn't have a diagnosis. Next slide. The next piece is that the equipment has to be used in your home. Now, that means that devices that are being ordered exclusively for use outside of the home can be denied. This is where we're going to use skilled information and careful wording of our letters of medical necessity to determine what kind of equipment is going to be useful to you and where you're going to use it. There are a lot of patients who are able to walk around inside their homes but need an electric wheelchair to go outside of their home for various and sundry reasons. If I write a letter of medical necessity indicating that the person needs a power chair in order to go out of their home, it is likely to be denied. I am gonna write a letter of medical necessity that then indicates that that power wheelchair is also gonna be used by the patient in their home to change positions throughout the day in order to uh, decrease their risk of a pressure sore and to decrease their risk of joint contracture. Meaning that the chair has all kinds of options for tilting, reclining, lifting your legs. It's going to allow you to change position readily inside your home and you're going to use it outside for mobility. Now, we want to talk about kind of the categories of equipment while we're talking about this topic. There are specific categories. You could think of them almost as silos, and those categories address a variety of at-home mobility issues. So one issue could be mobility, literally moving around inside your home. So several things belong in that silo, a walker, a transport wheelchair, a manual wheelchair, a power wheelchair, uh, even braces for your legs. All could be considered in that help you walk at home silo. Then you have a separate silo that is moving from one surface to another, getting out of bed, getting in and out of the shower or on and off a shower commode chair, getting on and off the commode. That's considered patient lifting. That's different than patient mobility. That's a separate silo. You can purchase pieces of equipment from the different silos or categories at the same time. So we could do a mobility device and a patient lifting device at the same ordering moment. What I cannot do is order you a walker and a power wheelchair at the same time. Your insurance company is gonna say, well, you're using a walker so you're able to walk, therefore you don't need your power wheelchair. 
So we need to be careful in how we're staging the purchase of different pieces of equipment and what equipment me may guide you into purchasing out of pocket in order to maximize the usefulness of your coverage. For instance, an early recommendation in my ALS clinic might be that a patient should have a transport wheelchair for emergency use when they're in the community. Now, that is gonna run between $100, $150 here in central Pennsylvania. Not what I would call a big ticket item because the power wheelchair is gonna run $20,000 and up. So that's what I would like to bill to your insurance when and if you're ready for that piece of equipment. So I'm gonna encourage you to purchase a transport wheelchair out of pocket or look to see if your clinic has a lending library that can loan you pieces of equipment for temporary use. Now, I will tell you the story of the little 10 year old boy with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy who could walk 10 feet by himself, which was considered household distances. He was denied a wheelchair to get out of his home to go to school. I had a peer to peer meeting with a physician at medical assistance. And the physician argued that the child could walk in the home and therefore could have been schooled at home with visiting teachers from the school district and he did not need to leave his home. I did not move that person and that decision stayed right where it was. The child's chair was denied. We had to wait and try to figure out how to make his current chair useful for him for a little longer. And then when he was no longer able to walk those distances in his home, we were able to purchase him a new chair. So these things really do happen. And it's part of why we really want to have an experienced team working with you to help you figure out how to stage the purchases of the things that you need. Next slide. All right, some of our exceptions. So there are many, many items available that make life easier when you have a disability or when a family member has a disability but these are not necessarily going to meet the yardstick for coverage as an exception. I wish they did. Uh, specified equipment can be covered under very specific conditions, even if they don't meet the definition of DME, because they're going to be used for a medical purpose, and even if they're used in the absence of illness or injury. So an example, I think examples make it a lot easier to understand some of this language, um, a, a pressure relieving mattress is available over the counter. So any person who has difficulty sleeping at night may find a pressure relieving mattress helpful. That doesn't mean that person has a disability. A person with a disability may be losing muscle mass and therefore they are at greater risk for loss of skin integrity, developing a pressure sore. And so they need a pressure relieving mattress for that medical need. So in that very specific situation, we can demonstrate to the insurance company that this mattress is going to remediate the problem of a bed sore. Um, and it may even serve a preventative purpose in a population at risk for bed sores, even if they haven't had one yet. Um, you have to show real medical necessity for the item. By doing so, we need to show that the item is being included in the physician's course of treatment and that a physician is supervising its use. This is something that we achieve through the documentation of a skilled physician who understands disability and understands the kind of language to use that they're supervising the skin, um, you know, they're checking it each visit or, or they're discussing it with the patient. Do you have a bed sore? Do you have red areas? Um, and that there's, that's what uh, constitutes supervising the use of that equipment. Next slide. Certain things are simply not DME. And there really isn't going to be a way to get things covered by an insurance company. Any kind of equipment that basically serves a role of comfort or convenience for the patient or is primarily for the convenience of the caregiver. Things like elevators, stair glides, um, posture chairs, 
cushion lift chairs. These are things that are readily available over the counter. They're not considered medical in any way. They really are for providing access and to make it easier to move someone from one place in the home to another. They do not meet the yardstick for reimbursement. Similarly, things that I as a physical therapist might recommend, such as different kinds of fitness equipment, um, is not going to be considered durable medical equipment. There are some first aid or precautionary types of equipment uh, that is also not gonna be covered as medical. And self-help devices, even grab bars in the bathroom, and certainly some of the wonderful tools that are available to help a person to continue to make food for themselves and to feed themselves with independence are not considered medical in nature. Now, let's talk about coverage under Part B of Medicare. Coverage for DME has four major parts. We're gonna take them one at a time. The first one, medical necessity, I think we've already hashed out pretty well. We've talked about how it needs to help you with an injury, an illness, a disease, or a condition, how we have to uh, document all of that, and how your diagnosis codes need to line up with the equipment codes to demonstrate the medical necessity. Let's talk about that it has to be prescribed. So you need a prescription from a doctor, and depending on where you are in the country, who can prescribe may be different. The uh, medical enrollment of both the doctor and the supplier of the equipment have to be in place before the order is um, sent in. There is a relatively new wa uh, rolling walker on the market called the stand-up walker, which unfortunately the manufacturers have not yet enrolled as Medicare providers. And so that is gonna be excluded from your Medicare Part B coverage. The last of the four pieces is the device has to be deemed cost-effective by Medicare. Generally speaking, that means it needs to be the least expensive option on the market that's going to get the job done. Next slide. So prescribers differ by state and uh, uh, by the area of the country. So when we look at who can prescribe, medical doctors anywhere in the United States, if they have MD after their name, they can prescribe durable medical equipment. That does not mean that they necessarily have the knowledge of your particular neuromuscular disease to independently determine what type of equipment they should be prescribing. Some do, some don't. DOs or doctors of osteopathic medicine, if they're licensed to practice both medicine and surgery in your state are allowed to prescribe under Medicare. Physician's assistants, as long as they're treating the patient for the condition that indicates the item, and they have to practice under the supervision of an MD or a DO, and they have to have their own NPI number. That is a national provider number um, that allows you to enroll in federal um, reimbursement uh, structures, such as medical assistance and Medicare. Um, so there's a lot of ands in that. So not every physician's assistant is necessarily going to meet all of those yardsticks. Um, so if you're having a physician's assistant as your primary care provider and you want them to prescribe, you're going to need to ask them if they're allowed to prescribe under Medicare guidelines, and they should know that. Um, nurses in some parts of the country are able to prescribe, but again, there's a lot of ands in this statement that link together the yardsticks for nurses. They have to be treating the patient for the condition. They have to be practicing independently of a physician, which I find interesting. And they have to bill Medicare for other covered services using, again, their own provider number. I don't think nurses get an NPI per se, but I think they have a different kind of number that um, registers them as a provider in the federal system. Um, and around here in central PA, I don't know of any nurses that are practicing independently of a physician. So that may be a state by state basis. Podiatrists are limited by each state statutes and are, no matter where you are in the United States, they will always be excluded from ordering powered mobility. 
Um, podiatrists in, in central PA more often are ordering things like um, foot orthotics um, rather than durable other kinds of medical equipment like power chairs or wheelchairs or patient lifting devices and things of that sort. Chiropractors are excluded everywhere in the US from ordering any kind of um, durable medical equipment. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about accepting assignment. These are all terms that you're going to hear as you're um, working through uh, achieving uh, medical equipment. So buying DME is different than buying a car or buying a steak where there's a price and you pay it. Um, it's a little bit closer to buying a car than it is to buying groceries in that the dealer that you go to buys the car from the manufacturer and then sells it to you. They presumably have some kind of guidelines on how they're going to charge you, but we've all seen what looks like the exact same new car for sale at different prices set by individual dealers that is controlled by different factors in their particular area. Maybe they're having a sale, whatever. DME also has a price tag. It is also bought by a vendor referred to in most cases as an assistive technology professional. That's actually a credential that they have to earn. It's sold to you and paid for by your insurance. However, Medicare enrolled providers have to agree to accept the assigned figure for the device. They have to agree to charge you only the deductible and coinsurance amounts that are specified by Medicare. And most of the time they wait to see what they're going to receive from Medicare before they ask you to pay your share. They have to submit your claim directly to Medicare and they cannot charge you for submitting that claim. These are built in protections for you as the consumer to limit and control your costs. Generally, the middleman who is the vendor is the one who's going to get a bit of a squeeze in that uh, manufacturers work very hard to bring their items to market in a, in a cost factor that's reasonable and aligns with the Medicare figures, but the vendors have very little window for upcharging as they resell it to you to make any kind of profit. The largest amount of profit they're going to make is on that original sale to you because when they have to uh, manage that device going forward as they would, you know, buying replacement parts, expanding the frame, replacing lost bolts and screws and things of that sort. Um, they're only able to charge a very small amount for their labor and they um, cannot charge an excessive amount for something like replacing a bolt. Uh, so the place where they make any kind of real profit is the original sale. Next slide. The last piece that we looked at was the idea of being cost effective. So cost effective generally means the least expensive version. You see there are two pictures of two safety beds um, that pediatric therapists frequently order for children with certain kinds of developmental problems. Um, often the um, severely autistic child has a lot of difficulty sleeping and maybe up for long periods during the night, but they're not safe to be in a room alone or um, having access to get into the home while the parent is sleeping. So they have a safe crib-like bed that is large enough for a toddler, a young child, even a teenager. Now, in Pennsylvania, medical assistance will cover one style of a safety bed. The white one with the blue around the bottom is called a Petticraft bed. That's the only one that medical assistance will pay for in Pennsylvania. Now, the other bed is a very attractive piece of furniture that someone might prefer, maybe because it has multiple windows to get the child in and out, maybe just the look of it. That's not going to meet the definition of medically necessary and cost effective. So um, in certain situations, Medicare or medical assistance will pay for the lower end item and you can pay the upgrade. So for instance, a Hoyer lift comes in a manual and an electric version. Medical assistance in Pennsylvania will pay for a manual Hoyer, but generally not an electric one. So you could pay the out of pocket for the upgrade to electric. 
in that situation. However, you could not apply to medical assistance for the petty craft bed, take the money that they give you for that, and then put it towards buying the more expensive bed out of pocket. I have not yet figured out why that is the case. My only explanation is that they don't see equity between the petty craft and the other styles of beds. They see those other styles of beds as, I don't know, less medical furniture. I, I haven't figured it out yet, but I know that it's true. Whereas one Hoyer lift is mechanical, is manual and one Hoyer lift is electric, they see one as only being an upgrade of the other. And so maybe it's even that it's the same brand. Now, um, patients can pay for a seat elevator on a power chair if it's denied. These are not usually denied for adults, but they're often denied for children. Another conundrum in my mind, uh, but I guess Medicare can say that adults have always been able to reach into cabinets and without the seat elevator, they're unable to do that. Whereas a child was not yet able to do that. And so that's giving them a skill they didn't already have. That might be one explanation. That's simply my opinion. Uh, next slide, please. So the next stage of achieving uh, the piece of equipment, once it's been decided what it is that you're gonna need, we need to write a letter of medical necessity. You heard me say that a couple of times earlier. The purpose of the letter of medical necessity is to clearly draw the lines between the need and the equipment. I have to have those codes that are gonna match up exactly with the equipment codes. And this letter, once it's written, is usually a minimum of three pages long because we literally have to justify every piece of the system. So the more complicated the system, the more complicated and longer the letter. We have to have an explanation for each piece. So seat elevators, tilt, recline, elevating leg rest, it all has to be justified individually, paragraph by paragraph. There are certain phrases that are eye-catching to those who read the letters at the insurance companies that will get you an automatic denial. And so there are ways that you need to be to keep up to date with what those phrases are to avoid them in order to uh, decrease the risk of an early denial and the need for an appeal just to clarify the letter. So for instance, we would not use the phrase provides comfort. We would use the phrase controls pain or reduces risk of. Um, we wouldn't use the term seatbelt because there's seatbelts in your car. We use the term pelvic stabilizing strap because its medical function is to align the pelvis as a stationary foundation for upright sitting and safe balance, as opposed to a seat belt, which keeps you from falling out. Not really medical. Uh, we're not going to use the phrase for the convenience of, we're going to use the phrase necessary for whatever it is. Um, I will say that there are some places where ATPs or vendors may write letters of medical necessity. At my facility and in central Pennsylvania generally, we have teams that include therapists and ATPs um, when we're specifying and indicating the equipment and doing all of the documentation that's necessary. Because we as a therapist understand what you need the equipment to do. We have the medical knowledge. We understand the diagnosis codes and why they indicate what I need the equipment to do. The ATP understands what device will do what you as the patient needs it to do. And they can tell me things like that headrest won't fit on that chair because it's a round peg in a square hole or you know, it's the wrong bracket, or that bracket won't work because you need this kind of bracket. Um, that's what I need those guys to do and to understand. And especially when you're talking about power equipment, it's extremely complicated to get everything to connect, to have everything you know, scalable, all of those things. Uh, we actually have a special physical therapist with training who stays on top of all the powered mobility because that is an ever shifting landscape. Next slide. So we're gonna finish up with what kinds of questions should you as a person with a neuromuscular disease ask your provider before obtaining your DME? So the first one is, 
Um, what do you expect this device to do for me? So why do you think I need this? Um, what I try to do in my clinic is explain the downstream problem from the diagnosis that indicates the equipment. So back to my foot drop explanation, you have weak muscles, that causes your foot to drop, that causes you to hike with your hip to lift your leg off the floor, that means you're burning more energy, you might trip, you might lose weight, you'll be short of breath. The brace is indicated to help you save your energy, save your muscle, not trip, stabilize you when you're walking. So I'm gonna explain all that if somebody says to me, why do you think I need a brace? Your therapist should be able to do that for whatever piece of equipment they're recommending for you. Next question is, are there other options that could do the same job? So um, back to the foot orthotic, I usually go over the different styles of brace for foot drop because there are a lot and I discuss my rationale for recommending one over others. And that rationale is gonna be different based on your diagnosis and your stage in your disease process. Um, the next question I would suggest is, is there some way that I can redesign my routines or even my home to avoid needing a piece of equipment? Um, we frequently talk to ALS patients about moving to the first floor. Um, if you move to the first floor, and you only have foot drop when you're really tired because you're running up and down the stairs 12 times a day, but you move to the first floor, maybe you don't need the brace right now because you're not gonna be so tired. So that's an option. Um, maybe redesigning your routines, sitting to bathe and dress might save enough energy that you don't need um, a transport wheelchair right now, or you don't need, uh, I'm running out of ideas but you get the idea. Next question would be, how am I gonna to learn to use this? So am I giving you something that's complicated enough that you need somebody who already knows how it works to show you how it works? I would say yes, if it's a Hoyer lift, I want you and your family trained on how they work. Buy a physical therapist, not the guy that drops the thing off at your house. When I make a recommendation for equipment, I talk about whether I think the patient is going to need additional formal therapy, maybe gait training in a device. Um, if they're using a new brace, maybe I suggest they try it for a couple of weeks and if they have problems, they come back and we do a little gait training exercises with them. Most of the time for something like a walker, it's not necessary. I can do that training right there in my clinic. Last question would be, is it covered by insurance? And if not, are there any other funding resources? In my clinic, this is where I pull in my social worker and I say, listen, I need this guy to have X, Y, and Z, but I don't understand their coverage and they live in Maryland and they just come to our clinic. That social worker is my best friend um, when we come to talking about these sorts of things. And hopefully uh, there will be a social worker available to answer some of those questions. If not, your therapist could have a conversation with the vendor who would know what's gonna be covered and what's not. All right, the last thing I wanna do is just thank the people that helped me to pull all of this together. I did meet with a couple of different people and been picking their brains to make sure I had good information for y'all. And then some of my resources that I used in compiling some of the images and information that you saw today. I wanna to thank everyone for their attention. I think I ran a little bit long. Um, Michelle knows that I tend to run off a little bit uh, longer than uh, we thought. Thank you, Vicki. No, I think you did great. Let me go back to my presentation so we can go through our questions because we have so many already. Oh, great. Yes. So, Michelle, I can close out my slides from my end, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Go to our Q&A. Here we go. Oh, no. You just want to keep looking at my dog. <laughs> Love your dog. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, oh, I'm on the wrong one. Uh, I would like to move to our question and answer portion of the webinar. We will only be taking questions that were discussed um, in Vicki's part one content. If you have any questions on learning how to use DME, DME maintenance and replacement, please register for part two of our D 
DME series. Like I previously mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you're, you will see a Q&A bubble. Click on the bubble and type in your question. Okay, let's start. I actually was able to pull them up. Do you want me to um, hit the answer live button? Yeah, um, if okay. you want to start going through one and... Sure. So I'll just go down in order. Um, Jerry, uh, looking for a stair or chair lift. Um, no, they will not pay for that. That is going to be considered um, not medical in need because they're going to come back and say, you could just live on your first floor. And I realize that's, that's not a great option, um, but they're not going to pay for any kind of chair lift or elevator. Uh, somebody was asking about closed captioning right in the beginning. And I don't know if we were able to do that. We do not have closed captions on this webinar, uh, but when we upload it onto our YouTube channel, there is an option for closed captions. Okay, perfect. Um, Edward writes in about a simple way to transfer a person from a bed to a chair. Um, so since I don't know your entire situation, Edward, um, there are a lot of options out there for patient lifting devices that would be dependent on um, your ability to say, sit up independently, um, how much muscle control you have and balance and things of that sort. So I would say you probably need to meet with a physical therapist to be assessed for the simplest way to transfer because there's tons of different things out there. Um, there's something called the perfect lift, which is a really handy piece of equipment. Um, it was actually mom designed and it's basically a sheet of nylon with a variety of handles sewn around the edges to slide under somebody and let two or three people pick somebody up. Uh, but again, there's tons of stuff out there. I think you probably need an evaluation. Um, Karen asked, where do you get a social worker? So in my life, it's pretty easy because I'm blessed to have one in every clinic in which I work. I would say, Karen, to ask your physician if they are aware of a social worker within their medical system. Um, if they're not, then the next place you'd probably go would be um, a county facility, a county agency. I'm trying to think of um, the one for adults in my area, Office of Vocational Rehab might um, give you a pointer. You could even Google social workers and see if there's anybody listing in a system that's near you. Um, I see one from Dina saying, I have MD and I was denied Medicare because of income. Um, hmm. So uh, you probably, so Medicare should not have denied you with your diagnosis. Might depend on where you live. That's gonna be something I would have to boot over to either a social worker or um, in some physician's offices, they have um, a specific person who works with insurance approvals and adjustments and things like that. You may wanna check if you go to a an MD clinic, an MDA clinic especially, they should have a social worker available who could help you figure out what happened there. Um, I'm not sure, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have been because you have a disability. So it might be something about the um, submission of the disability information, but that doesn't make sense to me. In um, addition to that, Vicki, I do want to mention if you, if anybody has any state specific questions um, and you don't go to an MDA clinic uh, to go to our resource center online or write us an email at MDA at MDAUSA.org. Um, our resource center can get information for all states. So if you have any questions, uh, type in or call us at the resource center. That's great, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. Um, Danny writes in that she's an adult with MD looking to purchase her first scooter and she works and has private insurance. So when they say a procedure code, they're looking for the code that would indicate your need for a scooter. So that would be, I would call it a diagnosis code. Um, and some scooters are covered and some are not. Um, a little bit, it depends on, um, it's, you're not in the Medicare system, so your third, your private insurance is going to have its own list of inclusions and exclusions. And what would be probably the best thing to do would be to call in, ask for a case manager at your private insurance company. 
um, and find out where you can find uh, a list of what's covered and what's not covered. Third party insurance often follows the Medicare uh, definition of terms, but they will also go on to include or exclude specific devices on their own. And they have the right to do that as a private company. Um, I would be cautious, however. I will say I am not a huge fan of scooters um, for this reason. Um, the scooter's seating is not adjustable. So depending on the type of MD that you have and the type of stabilization that you may need while driving a motorized device, you're not going to be able to add anything to the scooter seating system. Um, they really are not adaptable. It's kind of like a, it is what it is when you buy it. And so if you have a decline over time, it's not going to be able to adapt to you. Um, and they're not, some of them are portable. The more portable it is, kind of the less stable it is. You may want to look into some of the newer portable power chairs that um, do have a little bit of adjustability in their seating. And honestly, my advice, because I'm a therapist, would be to find a therapist to work with, um, whether it's an outpatient physical therapist who understands neuromuscular disease, or you go to an MDA clinic where certainly they should have a PT that understands neuromuscular disease. Um, I would maybe get a little more information before you put out a lot of money for a scooter. Um, Stephanie had a comment, nurses do not usually prescribe, nurse practitioners can diagnose, treat, and in most states prescribe. In those states where they prescribe, they obtain an NPI. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Um, we have a variety of nurses working in our clinics. Some are RNs, some are CRNPs or clinical nurse practitioners. So yeah, there's lots of um, different things there. I have RNs who will, who will propose an order that's then signed by the doctor. Thank you for that um, update on that. Um, we have Anonymous saying that they had to pay out of pocket for a new power chair elevator, even though I had it on my original 10-year-old power chair with being able to flat out tonight, even though I had it on my previous chair. Hmm. So that's kind of an interesting problem. I'm not sure what they're deny why they phrase their denial. Um, in the letter of denial, they're going to, um, they need to explain why it was denied. There should be something there. It may be that because, well, let's see, it's 20, so 2020. It may be that between 2010, when you got your original chair, and 2020, something changed in your coverage that the seat elevators became a, a, an excluded um, device or option. So I would look for your letter, if you still have it, your letter of denial, and try to read through the lines and try to figure out why they denied it, uh, because that doesn't make sense to me, especially I'm assuming you're an adult. Yeah, it looks like this attendee also had um, something else denied. Mm -hmm. um, so he wants to know if, if they should try again using a different verbiage this time. Oh, yes, I see that now. The neurologist wrote for the powered toilet seat lifter, which was denied. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to be honest, I have never gotten a power toilet seat lift justified. Um, here at that point, um, we would actually start talking about a Hoyer lift and trying bathroom modifications to make the Hoyer mm -hmm. lift work or uh, overhead track lifts, which are also excluded uh, from Medicare at least. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, not knowing how you appealed the denial, I'm gonna say they probably determined that it was not the least expensive or most cost effective way of dealing with your issue. Um, that would be my assumption. So trying again with different verbiage for the same piece of equipment is not likely to be uh, fruitful. Um, so there's a point where I'll try to go to bat for somebody when they have a device that they really, really want to try and they really think it's going to solve their issue. We'll go to bat um, and do appeal after appeal. But at some point, you have to decide that your efforts are just not going to move the mountain and look for a different option, which is unfortunately the world in which we live. There are more pieces of equipment available than there are covered pieces of equipment. Um, yeah, which is also something we're going to talk about in the next webinar. So um, Anonymous, you may want to uh, log into the next webinar. You might find some tips in there as well. Um, 
Okay, so Addie says, my secondary insurance may pay for a foldable portable power chair if Medicare doesn't, it would help me fit through doorways. Are there any instances where they'll pay for a smaller foldable power chair? Um, actually, yeah. Um, they, generally speaking, um, because they're not as expensive as what I would consider like a full-blown power chair, you can usually get them through Medicare. At least I've been able to in, in central PA. Um, the issue then would become if that becomes... If you advance to a point where you need to have the seating options of a full-blown power chair, they're going to deny it unless it's five years after they've paid for the foldable power chair. The foldable ones, while they definitely meet a need, are not in the same scope as a full-blown chair. Um, they don't have the seating options. They don't have the drive access options that people may need as their disease progresses. So depending on your diagnosis, if you're confident that your needs are not going to substantially change in the next three to five years, you could put it through your Medicare and see what happens. Um, and then you're a little bit rolling the dice to make sure that if you progress sooner than you think and you need something more substantial, you'd have enough medical diagnostic change to warrant purchase before replacement. So that's another, like, a, I don't want to call it a loophole, but a little bit like a loophole. If the patient's disease has advanced more rapidly than it was perceived to be initially, sometimes you can upgrade or, or replace a piece of equipment with something more substantial using that change in their medical situation as the justification. Um, that takes a lot of, a lot of work, but it's not impossible. Okay. Um, Anonymous says, my son has private insurance. How can I get help to obtain any future equipment he may need? Is this only for Medicaid insurers? So Medicaid is the, is a, is the state and federal program for people living under a certain income line, whereas Medicare is for 65 plus or under 65 with a disability. Um, if your son has private insurance, I'm not sure, he could still have Medicaid. I mean, you, could, you can buy private insurance and still meet the yardstick, the income yardstick for Medicaid. Um, so getting help to obtain future equipment, to me means that you should connect yourself and your son to a clinic that has a therapist and hopefully a social worker, a knowledgeable doctor based on your diagnosis. Um, again, I'm really blessed where I work that we have access to all of that. We have OT in the clinic. We have all kinds of assistance in our clinics um, because we, I work at a major medical facility in central PA. So that's, that's what it is. Um, when you're talking about future needs, um, his insurability is going to change. He might get to a point where he goes on Medicare. Um, so as things change, that's going to change what he's eligible, what his coverage is for different things. So I do think that logging into our next webinar will be useful for you because you're going to see some of the different equipment that he might use in the future. But I would say try to find yourself a nice multidisciplinary clinic um, that's not too far away from where you live. Uh, Addie, I will move after I get a power chair. Will this then pose a problem fixing it at the original vendor? Well, it depends on how far you're moving. Um, where I live, our vendors service the entire central Pennsylvania area. Um, they, you know, if you're moving out of state, um, you're just going to, it's not going to be an option really to use your original vendor. So um, what I would probably recommend is if you already know where you're moving to, I would start reaching out now to those vent to a vendor in that area and say, listen, I'm buying a power chair here from this vendor X, Y, Z. And I want to know once I move, or, or would you be willing to service it for me? Understanding that eventually I'm going to need other equipment and I would, you know, assume we will use you as that vendor for that. Um, but I would try to uh, make a connection before you move. Um, my husband has FSH. Stephen Hawking type, fully cogent. Yep, best to get getting an iPad. Um, so if you're looking to get an iPad, so didn't really consider communication devices as part of my DME, because I am blessed again to have a speech therapist in my ALS clinic who does um, the iPads and, and the MyTobies and those kinds of things. So I would reach out to your insurance company 
and ask them if the if an iPad and the apps you need would be considered DME. Uh, I'm not sure if they would exclude it because it's an electronic device that can be typically used by anybody, but some of the apps you need to, to voice activate and use eye gaze are pretty salty. Mm -hmm. um, if they come back and say, no, we consider software and apps not DME, because it, really it really doesn't meet the criteria for DME. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, they pretty much assume that communicating is not a medical necessity. I know that sounds insane to every normal human, but these are the definitions that they write. Um, I would bet that you'll have to buy the iPad. You may be able to find a foundation near you if you have trouble uh, purchasing the software that you need, that the apps and such. Um, you may be able to find uh, somebody near you that you could, you know, write, they would help you write a grant to get some money for something like that. Um, boy, I wish I had had my speech therapist sitting next to me to answer that one. Um, Kathy, if you would like me to, I can ask her this question. I'll be seeing her this week. And if you want to uh, log into the second webinar, I'll try to have an answer for you. Kathy, also, um, thank you so much for that question. I am going to write a mental note. That way we can have a webinar in the future about assistive devices and smart assistive devices. So thank you. Oh, I love that idea. And yeah. I have just the, the speech therapist for you, actually. Um, okay, well, Jennifer sure. has a comment, invaluable. Oh, well, thank you very much for that beautiful comment, Jennifer. I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to find some local resources now that you kind of know what to look for. Um, Addie asks, what kind of mattress will they pay for to prevent ulcers? Uh, oh, that's a question for my, my registered nurse uh, because she gets gel overlays for our pediatric patients with um, Duchenne. So I know that in central Pennsylvania, we can get medical assistance, which is you know that other arm of Medicare, to pay for a gel overlay. So I would start with that. And then um, again, I would, I, I'm a big fan of calling the 800 number on the back of your card and trying to get to a human so that you can talk about exactly what, or, what is or is not um, reimbursed in your area and the process. You can also call local vendors. You can look up durable medical equipment vendors in your area who cover those kinds of things and find out uh, directly from them because they will also know. Um, Addie's question about the mechanical toilet seat riser. I think we kind of addressed that. I doubt that it's going to get covered. Um, nylon ankle brace, probably. Um, that's just kind of a statement sort of sitting there from Claude. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if he's asking if he got it. He kind of sounds like it was covered. Which yeah, I think, he's, me. I think he's saying he got it covered. Okay. Interesting. Um, I have not tried to get stuff like that covered. Um, mostly, I rec you know, I don't recommend them a whole lot. Most of what I'm ordering are um, ankle foot orthoses that require an orthotist to order and fit. Mm -hmm. um, how can we repair a power chair? So you need to go back to the vendor that sold you the power chair and um, ask them, set up an appointment for them to evaluate it. Um, certainly batteries need to repl be replaced every so many years, lost screws. Um, one thing is you really don't wanna try to do a whole lot on your own, um, only because there are certain things you might do to the frame of a chair that would actually invalidate its, its warranty with the vendor. So I wouldn't do things like drill holes to like put in new screws, stuff like that. That'd be a bad idea. Um, I would definitely go back to the sailing vendor. If you don't have access to that person or you, you, you're just, you have no idea where it came from, you can call your insurance company because they would know who they paid for it. Or you can call another local company and see if they can help you. Um, Jim, last three, last year, three told me Medicare would not pay for a Hoyer lift anymore. Um, that surprises me. I don't know where you live, Jim, but I routinely get them at least, sometimes they'll do a rent to own. They might rent it for a little while. Um, and, and also my ALS clinic sometimes has them in a loaner closet. And so sometimes we loan them out. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure where you are, but I'm surprised at that. 
Yeah, Jen, um, I would suggest going, uh, giving our resource center a call to see if there are any loan closets in your area that are able to lend you a Hoyer lift if you're having trouble getting, uh, getting one. Thank you. Um, Terry writes in, do you have recommendations? Do you recommend having my power chair looked at on a regular basis? I actually do. And that is something we're going to be addressing in more detail in the next webinar. Um, Frederick, trouble getting in, missed the first 15 minutes. Is there a replay? Um, Michelle? Yes, replay? We, yes, we are recording this webinar and it will be available um, once we have it uh, uploaded to MDA's YouTube channel. I will send a link to everyone that's registered today with the link. Yes, and here's a question from Addie. I think she was the one that was talking about the simple foldable portable power yes. chair. I think I kind mm -hmm. of addressed this answer there. Um, ba okay, Anonymous has a basic power chair purchased on my own occasional outings. Um, no, as long as you paid for something out of pocket, your insurance company um, is not going to take that into account. Um, they're not going to tell you that you can't uh, get a different power chair now because you have already purchased a basic one. So yeah, you absolutely can be evaluated and have a new power chair specified and put it through your insurance. Anything that you buy out of pocket in their mind doesn't exist. Um, if they didn't buy it, they're not keeping track of it. Is there a website that specifies different types of lifts and costs? So, I mean, I, Anonymous, I go through Google a lot. I do Google images a lot and look for different things. There are a ton of different lifts out there. Um, you're, I don't know that I always see exactly the cost. If you go on something like um, rehab.com, um, there, you're going to see different um, um, online vendors are going to have their prices out there, um, but they're not going to bill your insurance company for you. And trying to buy something out of pocket and then submit it to Medicare is not an easy process. Um, certainly you can, um, I empower everyone to go out and look around and see what you have available. I know that the MDA, um, as well as the ALS Foundation have um, patient groups online where people can have, you know, they can post questions, get information about what worked or didn't work uh, for other families or other patients. So that might be another way of looking out there and seeing what's available. Um, but again, what's available is not the same thing as what's covered. So just be aware of that. There are some private insurances that will pay for other lifts besides the Hoyer brand. Um, so um, it's worth looking around and then looking into a vendor, looking into a therapist who can help you figure that out. Um, okay, Carl writes in, he's been living with ALS for 14 years. Most social workers are available for emotional support, but not specifics. Isn't that interesting? Um, attend U of P clinic in Philly. Can you recommend a social worker? I live in central New Jersey. So um, um, I would say Carl, reach out to our resource center and they connect you to a social worker in our MDA care center who lives closest to you. That would be awesome. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, Donna writes in, I have DMD. Should I build a professional care team? Who should be on it? And what resources can I use to locate them? So um, Donna, I like having a professional multidisciplinary team. I don't know that I've ever had a patient ask me if they could build their own, um, primarily because I work in a facility that supports the use of multidisciplinary teams. So my first recommendation for you would be to search your area for a major medical facility and see if they have a neuromuscular team in place that you can access. Um, generally speaking, you're looking for a neuromuscular specialist neurologist. Um, I'm assuming you're an adult, so, um, you know, an adult neurologist who specializes. Um, it should include a physical therapist, an occupational therapist. Um, I think icing on the cake is the social worker. Speech language pathology um, are useful, but they're not always present in every clinic. Um, and then nurse management, which I think is crucial. They fill in all the gaps for us and, and make all the connections for us. So those would be the people I would suggest. But first, try to see if there's a team in a reasonable commute from your home that already exists. Yeah, Donna, check out MDA.org. Look for the closest MDA care center. Um, that way you don't have to research 
for your own providers and doctors. We have tons of multidisciplinary clinics across the country with all of the specialists that you're looking for. So check, check it out on MDA.org. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, Joshua I know we've gotten, in. I know we've got a little over, so I don't want to to have you here for you know another hour or two. Yeah, so there are a lot of questions. Oh yeah, my goodness. If, so many questions. If you want to answer maybe two or three more, and then we'll have to save the rest for part two. Okay. The other thing is, there's an option here to type an answer. It, will that stay up when you close things, or will that go away? Because maybe no, I can that'll sit go here and just. Away. Mm, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll do my best guys. Um, there is, I have never seen a device tilting bedridden patients. Um, I think that they exist. The recommendation is an alternating air pressure mattress that has baffles um, head to toe that alternate in, uh, inflating and deflating on a schedule um, that tilt the patient side to side. Um, won't pay for a chair lift. I think a physical therapist is the best person to write a, a letter of medical necessity. Um, a BCBS, you FSHD, you should qualify for Medicare because of your disability. So I would at least apply. Uh, leg lifting for LGMD, four times the Amazon. Uh, uh, Janet needs an evaluation from a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Um, Becker's MD, you should apply for Medicare with a disability. You should be able to um, check with your doctor on um, if they have somebody in the office that can help you get started. Um, LGMD needs a therapist. If you like to call, call your primary care physician, they may have a practice they like. Otherwise, walk your fingers through the yellow pages, search for neuromuscular physical therapist and see what you come up with, or even neurology-based physical therapy, something like that. Um, MDA's Resource Center can also help with that, so give them a call. <laughs> oh, sweet. Um, yes, the VA covers durable medical equipment. In fact, uh, when I have a veteran, thank you for your service, Mike. Um, we always send prescriptions directly to the VA so that the patient has no co-pays, no co-insurance, no cost at all. You deserve it. Um, they might take a long time to get you what you need, but they're going to get you everything you need. Uh, let's see. Equipment that helps someone get up from the floor safely. That's going to be a Hoyer Lift Anonymous um, or some other patient lifting device. Uh, oh, all right. Uh, flying through, getting a little crazy. Um, <laughs> denied similar price. Oh, issued the month before. Yeah. So the reason they're denying your carbon fiber AFO is because they say they already paid for an ankle brace. The code for those two braces, despite the difference in cost, is the same code. So in their mind, you're in the same silo. You're in device to help the, le the weak leg work. So they said, well, we already bought you something for that. You don't need anything else. Um, now they should have, actually, I read it a little more clearly. You had a tib fib fracture or fib tip fracture, and you got the nylon brace for that. And then you wanted an AFO for your IBM. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about that, Claude, but I'm guessing that because they felt like they already bought you something for your ankle, they didn't understand why you needed something different. Um, LGMD get help dressing, toileting, Hoyer lift. Um, yeah, so um, Nicole, you and your brother, sounds like you need an OT evaluation. Um, they are phenomenal at figuring out ways to do activities of daily living. Um, so look for an OT who does neuromuscular disease or neurology patients. Um, yeah, that's another mental note for a future webinar. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I have the best OT for you. Oh, send them um, on my way. Test and rank portable folding power chairs. Oh, you know, there's a question for the MDA. I don't know how you would go about figuring that out, but um, the ranking, testing and ranking portable folding power chairs, because there are a lot that have exploded mm -hmm. onto the market just recently. We don't have that resource currently available, but I would definitely check YouTube. You know, you always see reviews and um, different types of videos on pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Google some brands and put them into YouTube. See if you can find a review. 
um, the difference between durable medical equipment and ADLs. So aids to daily living are things that are not necessarily considered medical equipment and they're not, they don't fall in line with the durable. So if you look at the slides from the very, very beginning when we talked about the definitions of durable medical equipment, um, your aids to daily living are gonna be things like um, uh, enlarged foam handles for um, your utensils, um, sock pullers, um, sock donners, um, reachers, those kinds of things are not going to meet that yardstick for durable. The Medigap and supplemental policies, um, they, they will cover, they don't cover what Medicare denies. They cover the portion of Medicare covered devices that is on you. So Medicare will generally pay 80%. Those Medigap and supplement policies will cover the 20%. But if Medicare denies it, it's unlikely that your Medigap is going to cover it. Um, a third-party private insurance might cover it, but that's different. Um, expected use of you making renovations. Um, Do you want to so, answer one more? Sure. Uh, yes. Sun has DMD. Okay, I got to do this one about the kid D with DMD because that's my okay. wheelhouse. Okay. Uh, scooter to get him a pumpy beef prep. Yes, so the kid with DMD going to middle school. Um, if you need a scooter, talk to your school first. Find out if they own equipment because they might, but they might not. If they don't, then it is on you to provide the equipment your child needs to get around, and you would be able to go through whatever his insurance is. Medicare and Medicaid will are never the first pay source if you have private insurance. So you'd have to apply, you'd have to submit it through your private insurance. They would give you whatever they're gonna give you. You take the balance and submit it to your Medicare or your Medicaid, and they're gonna give you probably 80% of that. Um, so I hope that that was helpful. Um, okay, whew. I know so many, you went through so many. I think I, I think you answered like 40 questions, so. Oh my gosh. For I feel like I'm leaving them all in the lurch though. Thank you so much for, you know, staying an extra 15 minutes and answering. You're getting tons of comments, great information. Thank you very much. Very Oh, great. So we definitely appreciate it. Let me go back and share my screen. I will let everybody know. I know there was some questions about the second part of the webinar. So I will go through that. If you have any more questions, I know you. I know there's a ton to, uh, left to answer, but if you have any more, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow back up with you. The second part of our DME Engage webinar series will be held on August 10th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. To register for part two, you can visit that website. I know it's quite long, so I'm actually going to chat the page into the chat function so everyone can just click the link. Register for this one as well. I've just sent it to all attendees. Also, thank you again to our event sponsor, Hillrom. Uh, we would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support. Thank you very much. Vicki, thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you for answering so many questions. Uh, we appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do for the neuromuscular community. So thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for asking me. I really enjoyed myself and I hope the information was useful to a wide variety of people. Yes, Vicki will be back on August 10th to talk about the second part of uh, the webinar mention a couple of the things that you'll be talking about in the second part? So we're going to be talking about how you might be considered eligible for different parts, different specific pieces of equipment. We're going to talk about all the steps in the process of obtaining it. We're going to talk about the different types and the uses of equipment that are most commonly used by patients with NMDs. We're going to talk about how to use it, how to maintain it, and how to decide if it needs to be replaced. Awesome. Thank you so much. And more comments are coming in talking about what a great job you did and how helpful and so much Thank information. You. And, so and I'm going to get some answers to some of these outstanding questions from my, uh, my team this week. So I'll make sure that I include that in the August 10th event. 
Awesome. We would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. A web page will pop up with a short survey on today's webinar. If you do not have a smartphone, once the webinar is over, a screen will pop up with the survey as well. I'm so sorry. <laughs> If you are new to MGA through this program and are diagnosed with one of the over 43 diseases under MGA's umbrella or are a loved one of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MGA. You can do this by visiting mga.org slash join and completing a short form. MGA has recently launched a new series of programming called MGA Access Workshop. If you want, I'm sorry, my doorbell rang. Okay. My dog is sitting up and now he's going to start. No, no. <laughs> so Love my dog. Uh, if you want more information on durable medical equipment, visit the Access to Coverage Equipment Assistive Devices, Devices Workshop, which includes online activities, videos, and more that you can navigate at your own pace. Check out mda.org slash care slash access dash workshops to take the DME workshop and view upcoming workshops. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar, Medical Equipment and Assistive Devices for Neuromuscular Disease, Part 1. We hope to see you on August 10th for Part 2. Thank you very much for attending and have a great rest of your day. Bye.